Well, welcome everybody to this uh, CFTNI webinar on a beautiful day in Washington, DC. Um, I am Jeffrey Kemp, Senior Director for Regional uh, Programs. And today we're going to discuss the challenge of Iran. Now, does that sound familiar? Um, starting with Jimmy Carter, in the late 70s, uh, Biden is now the eighth president um, to face the challenge of Iran. It's, why is it important right now? Uh, well, one reason is that the Trump administration made a deliberate point of leaving the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, in May of 2018. And a lot of um, waters flowed under the bridge in, in these past two and a half years. Um, Iran has resumed enrichment, not to war levels yet. <clears throat> Iranian missile development has continued at a pace, as has its transfer of more advanced missiles to groups such as Hezbollah and Yemen, there is an extraordinarily unpleasant, uh, unfinished war in Yemen. There's an unfinished war in Syria that involves the United States, Israel, Iran, and others, including Russia. There is still instability in Iraq that has a strong Iranian footprint. China's relations with Iran have made strides since uh, the Trump years, mid-2018, mid and China and Iran seem to be establishing a much closer uh, political and economic relationship. But to offset this, of course, there have been the, uh, the, the breakthroughs in relations between Israel and the key Gulf Arab countries, particularly the UAE and Bahrain, and perhaps Saudi Arabia at some point in the future. And, and against this backdrop, we also have to take into account three elections, which have great importance. First, our own, of course. Um, but then secondly, Israel has a, another, yet another election um, in March, and Iran has its presidential elections in June, which are always very feisty and always uh, very controversial. So, um, a lot's going on for the Biden administration to contemplate as they decide what to do. And to help them make that decision, um, we've got three eminently qualified uh, speakers who, uh, whose bios you, you can read in the uh, invitations we sent to you. Um, they are, and this is in the order they will speak, um, Gary Seymour from Brandeis, Ellen Lapson, currently at, at George Mason, and Shai Feldman um, from Safia in Israel. Uh, each of them are going to speak for between eight and ten minutes, and then um, maybe I'll have a question, I don't know. Um, then we'll turn to Q&A, and at the bottom of your Zoom, you have a device to ask your questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. And that's fairly straightforward. I think you've done this before. We're delighted to see a large audience, uh, at least on paper here. And um, without any further ado, Gary, you're up. Thank you very much, Jeff. And thanks to the Center for the National Interest for organizing this event. And thanks to everybody who's tuned in. So the Biden administration is still in the process of consulting about how to handle Iran and obviously looking at their options. I think it's quite likely that President Biden and his team will decide to try to revive the 2015 nuclear deal, the JCPOA, on the basis of compliance for compliance. The US would lift sanctions, Iran would constrain its nuclear program. That, after all, is the basis for the original deal. 
Um, from Biden's standpoint, that would be the quickest and the easiest way to restore constraints on Iran's nuclear program, to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapons option. Uh, and it would avoid a fresh confrontation with Iran over its nuclear program, which would distract President Biden from more urgent domestic and foreign policy challenges. So since the US withdrew from the deal in May of 2018, as Jeffrey mentioned, Iran has gradually exceeded most of the nuclear limits in the original nuclear agreement. They've increased enrich uh, enrichment levels, most recently up to 20% last month. They've increased their stockpile of low enriched uranium, which was allowed under the agreement. They've resumed enrichment at the Fordow, the underground uh, enrichment facility. They've begun to enrich with advanced centrifuges and they've begun to produce uh, uranium metal. So the Iranians have clearly moved their program forward since the United States withdrew from the agreement. Three important points I would make about the current status of Iran's nuclear program. First, their current capacity today is actually less than it was in 2015 before the nuclear deal took effect. So for example, in 2015, Iran had roughly 18,000 operating centrifuges and about 7,000 kilograms of low enriched uranium, uh, enriched below 5%. Today, Iran has roughly 6,000 operating centrifuges and about 4,000 kilograms of low enriched uranium. Now, of course, if Iran continues on its current path, it will eventually exceed the levels that it had in 2015 within six months or a year. The one area where Iran has made significant advancements since it left the nuclear deal, or since it began to exceed the limits, is in the area of advanced centrifuges. Under the JCPOA, Iran was allowed to conduct uh, research and development on advanced centrifuges, more efficient and powerful centrifuges. But since leaving or since exceeding the limits, Iran has uh, actually begun enriching with these centrifuges. So that's given it some important experience in terms of uh, its enrichment program. The second point to make is that Iran doesn't currently have a safe path for producing weapons grade uranium, 90% enriched uranium without detection. So-called breakout time, which is a way to measure enrichment capacity defined as how long would it take Iran to produce 25 kilograms of 90% enriched uranium, enough for one bomb? It may be a few months, but Iran could not conduct such an operation without being immediately detected by the IAEA inspectors. And so far, Iran has not been willing to run that risk, which could precipitate um, a military attack. And the third point to make is that all of the steps Iran has taken to exceed the limits in the nuclear deal, they can be easily reversed within a matter of weeks and verified by the IAEA. So Iran can very quickly reduce enrichment levels, ship out surplus stockpiles of low enriched uranium, dismantle the cascades of advanced centrifuges that are operating, end production of um, metal, uh, and so forth. The current position of the Biden administration is that Iran must restore compliance by taking these steps before the US is willing to lift sanctions. Naturally, the Iranian position is the opposite. Most recently expressed by Supreme Leader Khamenei on February 8th, that first the US must lift sanctions to Iran's satisfaction, and only then will Iran reverse its nuclear steps. Well, the obvious solution to this stalemate is some negotiated agreement for the US and Iran to take a series of reciprocal parallel actions. So for example, the US could partially lift some sanctions, Iran would partially roll back its nuclear activities, US would lift some more sanctions, Iran would reverse more of its nuclear activities until the status quo ante has been achieved. And in fact, Foreign Minister Zarif suggested recently that the EU could help mediate such a step-by-step -step 
approach to restore compliance for compliance, although I suspect direct negotiations between the US and Iran will be necessary. One important issue and a very complica complicated issue for restoring the 2015 nuclear deal is exactly what US sanctions the US would lift. Uh, in addition to the nuclear related sanctions that President Trump reimposed when he withdrew from the agreement, Trump imposed a number of other sanctions against Iran under statutes for counterterrorism, human rights, missile proliferation, and so forth. And some of those non-nuclear sanctions impede Iran's ability to benefit from the 2015 nuclear deal, such as its ability to sell, ship, and ensure oil sales and to gain access to the revenues from those oil sales. So presumably Iran and the US would have to come to an agreement on exactly what sanctions would be lifted and which of the Trump sanctions would remain in place because they don't impede Iran's ability to benefit from the 2015 deal. A final complication to restoration is Iranian domestic politics with their presidential elections due in June. As I mentioned, Supreme Leader Khamenei has publicly supported restoring the JCPOA, at least in principle. And President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif claim that they're authorized to negotiate a return to the deal. And obviously Iran's primary motivation here is sanctions relief to alleviate the damage inflicted on its economy by sanctions and intensified by COVID. Some Iranian experts speculate that Supreme Leader Khamenei would prefer to wait until after the presidential elections uh, to, retort, to restore the nuclear deal, in part to avoid allowing Rouhani and the so-called moderate camp to get credit for helping the economy. Other experts speculate that Khamenei is actually prefers near-term sanctions relief to avoid the risk of public unrest and that he's confident he'll be able to manipulate the presidential elections to support the candidate of his choice, whoever that is. Well, I don't know the answer to this. It's hard to read Iranian politics, but the only way to find out is through negotiations to determine whether Iran, whether Iran is willing to uh, accept a pathway back to restore the JCPOA. And as I said, I believe that uh, the Biden administration intends to test that proposition. Just very briefly, assuming the nuclear deal is resumed, the Biden administration has said they intend to begin follow-on negotiations to quote, strengthen and extend constraints on Iran's nuclear program and to address other issues uh, like Iran's ballistic missile program and its interference in region in countries around the region. Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and so forth. I think the reason for this emphasis on follow-on negotiations is twofold. First, the Biden team perfectly well understands that the physical constraints on Iran's enrichment program begin to lift after 2025, and they're removed completely in 2030, at which point Iran can expand its enrichment program to as large a capacity as it wishes, including numbers and types of centrifuges, stockpiles of low enriched uranium, and even higher enrichment levels. So to prevent that from happening, to prevent Iran from acquiring options for production of weapons grade uranium, uh, the US will wanna have a follow on agreement that will at a minimum extend the sunset clauses on the physical constraints on Iran's ability to produce fissile material. Secondly, the Biden administration recognizes that a standalone nuclear deal is not sufficient to address domestic American opposition and opposition in the region from US allies and partners like Israel and Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. So they're trying to reassure uh, uh, regional players in particular that the US is gonna try to address these other issues. Um, now, frankly, I don't expect to see very much progress in these follow-on negotiations. Uh, Iran will certainly resist an extension of the constraints on its nuclear program, although I suppose the threat of renewing sanctions and the offer of additional relief, like removing the primary 
U.S. sanctions against Iran might produce a new deal. On the missile front, Iran has deployed hundreds of medium range liquid fueled missiles uh, based on North Korean designs, which is Iran's primary long range offensive strike force uh, because Iran doesn't have an advanced aircraft. And the Iranians have made clear that they're not gonna constrain their missile program unless their neighbors and enemies and rivals constrain their purchase of advanced fighter aircraft, much of it from the United States. And the regional problems are even more protracted and convoluted. I'm gonna uh, uh, turn to Ellen to, uh, to discuss those. So in conclusion, I think there's a pretty good chance the Biden administration will decide to try to restore the 2015 nuclear deal. And despite the complications I mentioned, I think there's a straightforward path to achieve that because both sides want it. The US wants to restore constraints on Iran's nuclear program. Iran wants sanctions relief. I think the obstacles to an agreement can be reached and the deal can be restored. At the same time, I think the follow on negotiations for a new nuclear deal, for constraints on Iran's missile program, our limits on its regional activities are very unlikely to make uh, dramatic progress in the near term. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Well, thank you very much, Gary. That was an excellent sort of uh, overview of just what we wanted you to do. But you do raise these other issues, um, including the whole regional context. And Ellen will now discuss uh, the dynamics of what's going on in the region. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, delighted to be with you and to try to deepen our understanding of how is the Biden administration starting to think about the uh, enduring challenge of Iran. It's been around for a long time as a, as a foreign policy and national security uh, challenge for the United States. So where does the regional set of problems fit into uh, the Biden administration's view, knowing that the nuclear issue is the, is the front burner issue, is the, is, is the uh, highest priority? I think um, understanding what Iran is up to in the region, how much of a threat is it to regional friends and partners, uh, and does it pose a direct risk to the United States is, is an equally valid question. Uh, and I think just this week, the attack outside of Erbil by presumably pro-Iranian Iraqi Shia militia is an early test case for the Biden administration. How are they gonna navigate these these players who are presumably pro-Iranian doesn't necessarily always mean directly tasked by Iran. How do you how do you think about Iran's network of influence and and um, leverage that it enjoys in the region? But as Secretary of State Tony Blinken said yesterday, um, let's make sure that we're checking our assumptions. Let's make sure that we're um, you know not on automatic pilot of understanding what the nature of the problem is. So, um, you know, it is a conventional view that Iran is a source of instability in the region. Is it the only source of instability? Of course not. Uh, there are other, you know, governance issues and other challenges in the region, but there is a uh, very easy assumption that anything that goes wrong in the region, there must be an Iranian hand in it. And I think we want to step back from that. So let's remember that Iran has not achieved all of its foreign policy and national security goals in the region. Early in the revolution, we worried about uh, Iran exporting the revolution. It was very confident that it had a pan-Islamic uh, set of you know, virtues and values to transmit to the region that, and that they, they were gonna empower the downtrodden of the region to overthrow corrupt Sunni Arab regimes. That never happened, okay? The one place where it happened, it happened because of the United States basically toppling Saddam Hussein and handing a Shia majority country next door neighbor to Iran. So it created an opportunity for Iran. So, you know, Iran's, we should not assume that Iran gets everything it wants um, and that it has, that its policies have succeeded. In fact, there's quite a record of, of disappointment and uh, setback for them. But, and let's also remember that the tool of working with non-state actors in countries where you want to have leverage against the incumbent regime is a widespread practice in the region. Uh, the Arabs do it towards their Arab you know, rivals. Uh, think of the UAE or Qatar in Libya today or Egypt's role in Yemen, uh, 
Turkey's role in, in the Gulf, et cetera, Israel's ties to the Kurds during the Saddam era. This is a, a practice that we see in the, the sort of geopolitics of the region. Iran's greatest success and probably greater than any of those other examples is Hezbollah. Um, and, but so we assume that what it did with Hezbollah, it's trying to do with the Houthis in Yemen or with uh, groups in, in Syria, et cetera. But we have to, I would analytically say that Hezbollah is an outlier. It's an, it's an astounding success going from a Shia rights movement to an anti-Israel paramilitary force to now the largest power center in a sovereign state of Lebanon. Um, and, and certainly Hezbollah serves Iran's interests broadly in the region, including Hezbollah training other uh, Shia paramilitary groups, et cetera. But, um, but we should not assume that Iran can duplicate that success easily. The other places of priority to Iran over time have been the Shia of Bahrain. And here we're talking not Shia minorities, but Shia communities that are probably the majority uh, demographic. Um, but you know the Saudi embrace of Bahrain and various factors mean that Iran really hasn't achieved its goal of trying to bring Shia power into, into greater success in Bahrain. And I think they've largely backed off. Iraq, as I mentioned, you know, for 40 years, Iran harbored the anti-Saddam rebels, particularly Shia movements of various uh, persuade, various uh, manifestations. Um, but their great success was really the United States orchestrating the fall of Saddam. And now for sure, Iran is, has extremely large influence and leverage on politics in Iraq. And I think there is always a burden on the United States. Are we gonna, are we gonna match that? Are we going to stay involved enough in Iraq with both civilian and military support programs and political support um, that, that the Iraqis can somehow maintain a delicate balance between the United States and Iran as its two most important foreign policy relationships. Yemen, I would argue, is a distant fourth, but it has become more important. It is, was a target of opportunity for Iran, probably irresistible to support um, in, uh, a minority group that was challenging Saudi primacy in Yemen. Um, and, but Yemen is so complicated in terms of its own domestic politics that I don't think Iran would necessarily consider its relationship with the Houthi to be the equivalent of Hezbollah in Lebanon. So here's where, just to pick up on, on Gary's uh, point about, you know, where does the regional problem set fit in the JCPOA renegotiations, whatever we want to call them. Here's where the Biden administration may have an opportunity. Um, there has been a demand from both Israel and the Gulf Arabs to be consulted more or even to be formally included in follow on uh, negotiations with Iran. They feel that their interests were not adequately addressed by the Obama administration. I, it's debatable whether that's a, an objectively fair judgment or not, but um, I think that they, uh, there's an expectation that somehow they would be formally included. Uh, and I would argue that it would be very hard to change the diplomatic structure of the JCP OA negotiations. It, it actually, it derives from the NPT and from formal UN and IAEA processes. So I would uh, think it would be exceedingly difficult for the Biden administration to expand what countries are at the table when we negotiate with Iran. But that's where the regional issues become a, a, an opportunity. And I could certainly see Rob Malley, the new special envoy for Iran, being very taken with the idea of organizing some kind of a regional dialogue, a regional conference uh, that would allow Iran and key Arab states and possibly Israel, considering the Abraham Accords, uh, to look at sources of regional instability. And to me, Yemen is the opportunity. The Biden administration has already signaled that we got to go for diplomacy, we got to stop the military stuff and switch to a, a more robust diplomatic strategy. Uh, the Iranians over time have said the same thing, that they would be, you know, be willing to support or engage in uh, supporting a negotiated settlement, presumably some kind of power sharing arrangement in Yemen, exceedingly complicated, no easy answers. But even starting that process, to me, would be a contribution to regional security, to have a dialogue. And again, 
Shai can tell us whether based on the Abraham Accords, <clears throat> is, there's an expectation on Israel's part that they could be more uh, formally included in such conversations. I think that regional process could be happening simultaneous to the nuclear talks. They don't necessarily have to be sequenced. So, <clears throat> uh, so not to sound you know, too naive or optimistic, but I do think given the proclivities of the Biden administration, the belief in diplomacy, the experience of several um, Biden administration officials in dealing with Iran in the past, I think there's a fighting chance that they will be able to put something in motion. Whether the Iranians respond, whether the Iranians play hardball, whether they miscalculate how much power and influence they have over us, all of those are unknowns and could play out, it could mean that this offer uh, stalls out, that it never really materializes. But I do think that is um, uh, a long-term possibility. And let's remember whether we were listening carefully or not to what Obama was hoping to achieve with the JCPOA. As Gary said, he did think of the JCPOA as a, as a, ba as a baseline. And then on that, you would be able to build some additional um, activities. And so this regional dialogue would still be consistent with the notion that once the nuclear program is constrained, um, that you could then expand the conversation to other topics. Um, but, you know, I think we do have to remind ourselves that Iran is a sovereign actor. Iran has a, a voice in this process and the Iranians are not always um, strategically, they can often be very clever and, and seriously, uh, you know, um, formidable diplomatic players, but they can also miss opportunities. So it's not at all clear whether Iran today believes that the Biden administration can offer them a good enough deal to actually rethink their, their own behavior and posture in the region. But I think the Biden administration is likely to at least test that proposition. Thanks. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Ellen. And um, so now, Shai, um, tell us what the views from Israel are. Well, I can tell you what one individual's views are. Uh, <laughs> Good, that's fine. I think uh, I think there there are. Uh, first of all, I agree with everything that um, Gary and Ellen said. I'll just uh, put a uh, somewhat different um, twist on this. Um, I think we're facing three three challenges with respect to Iran. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, the, the role of the Iran issue in, in the U.S.-Israeli relations. Um, I, think, uh, I think that the, 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 the problem that we have right now is, uh, is, 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 has to do with the fact that the Trump administration abandoned the JCPOA, but without an alternative strategy. So, and they did not offer an alternative strategy. What they offered is a set of very far reaching demands for Iran, mostly articulated in Pompeo's speeches, um, but that's not a strategy. Uh, and it wasn't clear at all uh, how, how the Trump administration, uh, what the Trump administration's path forward uh, was. They certainly tried to exert so-called maximum pressure, uh, but they actually couldn't replicate uh, the kind of coalition uh, that the Obama administration successfully put together. They didn't have the Europeans with them, they didn't have Russia with them, and they didn't have China with them. So what kind, what kind of pressure they could put on Iran that would yield a, a, a better outcome than the JCPOA was never clear and they never clarified that. And we're essentially dealing, in my view, first and foremost on the nuclear issue with this basic fact that the US abandoned the JCPOA without really an, adopting an alternative strategy that one could articulate very clearly. Second, I think uh, the Biden administration uh, will have a challenge dealing uh, with the JCPOA's imperfections. They, they don't claim that the JCPOA is perfect. Um, they're, they're talking about uh, going back to the JCPOA framework, but, I, but they're also, I think, quite cognizant of the fact that the JCPOA 
uh, was imperfect and how do you correct or address these imperfections uh, is, is, a, is a real challenge. Not only the sunset clauses, um, but also I think there is, um, at least on some, in some quarters in the region, um, have, have seen the Iranians return to nuclear activities um, with relatively ease. Um, maybe not as quickly, and uh, I think Gary pointed out uh, that uh, this is going uh, slower um, than maybe some, um, some thought, um, but, uh, but I think this is another issue uh, that, uh, that the region is watching uh, and the region is, 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 uh, is worried about, and the question is, how is that going to be dealt with? And the third thing, the third issue here, and the third challenge here is, is how do we, how do you rebuild um, even a minimal uh, degree of trust that is required for, for a new and improved uh, JCPOA? We have, this is of course the, also connected to Iranian domestic politics because we have to remember that it became quite clear during the months leading to the JCPOA that the Supreme Leader is not opposed that in fact the Supreme Leader backed uh, Zarif and backed uh, Khamenei, but even as he, opposed, as, as he gave them the backing necessary and in fact the protection necessary uh, from quarters in the Revolutionary Guards that were against the agreement, he did not uh, stop for a second expressing his uh, pessimism and uh, I would say um, uh, disbelief uh, in, in, that the U.S. would actually carry uh, its obligations. Um, and to that extent, the Trump withdrawal from the JCPOA uh, clearly uh, provided the ammunition for those who opposed within Iran the JCPOA. Certainly the Supreme Leader could say, well, you know, that's what I told you would happen and that happened. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, that's the, the, the issue here is the, the balance within Iran uh, that was affected by Trump's uh, withdrawal from the JCPOA on this issue uh, has certainly shifted um, away from uh, even the, the support, which was always tenuous and, and but enough to, to reach an agreement that Hatami and Zarif uh, enjoyed, uh, that, uh, that equation has to be rebuilt and it's not so clear uh, how, how, that, uh, how that can, uh, how that will be done. On the issue of Israel and the US and Iran, I will make a few points about this. One is clearly Netanyahu, and I say Netanyahu, uh, was elated by Trump's uh, move, uh, namely abandoning the, the JCPOA. But I would say Israel, and I say this, uh, and, and I use the words carefully, Israel, uh, which is not always identical to Netanyahu, uh, Israel was well aware of the fact uh, that the U.S. Uh, did not have an alternative strategy, and in fact, uh, didn't really, couldn't even uh, project a credible um, uh, military option to back whatever alternative strategy there was, because it was very clear, I think, to Israel um, that Trump uh, had no appetite uh, for uh, involving the U.S. in any mil military adventures. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the region. The fact that 1,500 American servicemen on the Syrian-Iraqi border became such an issue uh, gave, it was an indication to whether there is any, any appetite uh, in the U.S. to exercise a military option uh, in, in, uh, in the region. And I would say also more than that, that I think that Netanyahu's nightmare, and, and I think a real nightmare, uh, was that if Trump will get reelected, uh, he will actually try to make a deal with Iran. Uh, and you could see that th there were a few instances where, uh, where Trump actually expressed this uh, desire uh, in, in the presence of, N and Netanyahu was present, and you could see his face almost, you know, freezing. Uh, and you could see that uh, he was quite terrified about, about this. And the one reason he was terrified about this is that he thought that if this were to happen, the United States would show the great, uh, or the Trump administration would show the same degree of competence 
uh, in reaching such an agreement that they did in the case of North Korea. Um, so, uh, so with all the support that Netanyahu and the closeness that Netanyahu um, um, expressed uh, to Trump, and of course, happiness with the other issues, the other things that Trump did, like moving uh, the American embassy to Jerusalem and recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Uh, on, on the Iran issue, I think that uh, Netanyahu was uh, quite fearful of what the, what, what the future uh, 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 will be. What is Israel's dilemma now? Um, I think, first of all, so I will say a few words about the nuclear and a few words about the non-nuclear issues. Um, I think the first issue that Israel has is how to deal with the Biden administration uh, on this issue. And I would say that Israel has to be, has to tread very, very carefully here because most of the people, most of the members of the Biden team uh, were of course the, the members of the team that negotiated, not all of them, uh, but those, he, they, this is the team that negotiated the JCPOA. So from that point of view, to frame uh, Israel's position as against the JCPOA, in my own view, would be a big mistake. Uh, I think Israel uh, has to articulate its position in terms of what, how to, what imperfections in the JCPOA it would like to, uh, uh, to, see, uh, to see corrected. Uh, but always remember um, that, uh, that Israel should avoid the kind of campaign uh, that it waged uh, at the time of the administration of the Obama administration. So I would say, first of all, uh, it has to be very careful not to surprise uh, the Biden administration and certainly not to play the kind of guerrilla warfare, uh, such as the Netanyahu's uh, agreement or consent with the consent of the Republic at the time, a Republic, Republican uh, majority in the Senate to, to give the kind of speech that he gave to the joint session of Congress. Uh, which was clearly an anti-Obama uh, campaign. I think from the Obama administration's point of view, uh, I think, uh, as I think uh, both Gary and, and certainly Ellen said, I, my sense is that the Obama administration is prepared to have a conversation with the Israeli government. But as I said, uh, they are not going to tolerate, in my view, I think they're more sensitive and than, the Obama, than Obama personally was. I think Obama actually tolerated quite a lot uh, from, uh, from Israel at the time. Uh, I don't think the Biden administration or Biden personally is going to tolerate as much as Obama uh, did. So in that sense, uh, the kind of speech that the uh, chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces gave a few weeks ago uh, was, a, in, again, it, I think it was a tactical, at least a tactical mistake uh, because it had the sounds of, of organizing a public campaign. Uh, on this. And as I said, I think the Obama administration is prepared to have a conversation, uh, but I don't think it's prepared to, 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 to have Israel conduct now uh, a, a campaign on this, uh, on this issue. Um, lastly, on the non-nuclear um, issue, I think that uh, as far as Israel is concerned, there are two um, complementary no's. Uh, the first no uh, is, is, is Iran's um, deepening involvement in Syria or deep involvement in Syria. Uh, and Israel has made it clear that it is willing to take very high risks uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to prevent this from, from, uh, from getting more entrenched than it already is. Uh, General Eisenkot, the, the previous uh, chief of staff of the IDF, had coined this, uh, uh, this uh, campaign called the Campaign Between the Wars. And the thrust of the campaign between the wars really was about Syria uh, uh, and Lebanon. So there, there, are two, there are two issues here. One is Syria's, uh, Iran's involvement in Syria. And the second, and that's the direct involvement. And secondly, there is the indirect. And the indirect is backing Hezbollah's attempt, if not directing it, uh, an attempt to extend, in, if you wish, the Lebanese front to Syria, to the, to the, to the Golan Heights. Uh, and as I said, Israel uh, has made it very clear that it is not going to tolerate uh, this, and it is, it is willing to, to, to continue to wage this military campaign. L lastly, I would say that uh, luckily for Israel, and that is something that, uh, that uh, 
Netanyahu deserves some credit for uh, is clumsily, in my view, uh, or to some extent, I would say, as irresponsibly as he uh, it, as he waged the campaign against Obama uh, at, the, at the time regarding the JCPOA, he's actually proven uh, to be very, very, um, how should I say? He, he, pro he proved great finesse uh, in, in, in actually creating a situation in which Russia, which is so close to where this campaign is being waged, has essentially tolerated uh, this. I cannot see any significant constraints that Israel has actually imposed upon itself in waging the campaign. Um, and again, we're talking about a very, very small theater of operations where the Russians have a very heavy military presence. And this has been going on now for months. Um, and how, is it been, how has it managed to go on for months? Indeed, because I think that Netanyahu has uh, developed a very close relationship uh, with Putin. The, the very close tactical coordination between the two uh, defense communities, the Israeli Defense Forces and the Russian military in, in Syria could not uh, happen uh, without, uh, without the understanding uh, that uh, Netanyahu was able to build uh, with Putin about you know, what Israel's boundaries are uh, and what its interests are and so on and so forth. Um, but it's, it's a dicey situation, again, because of the very closeness, of pro geographical closeness between, uh, between the two militaries. Um, one mistake, uh, one small mistake uh, could have great consequences. We haven't seen this again because of this close cooperation, but this is a big challenge. The, the tactical challenges here of continuing waging this campaign uh, week after week, month after month, uh, again, with these two objectives of preventing an Iranian entrenchment in Syria and preventing the extension of the Syrian, of the Lebanese front to Syria is a major, major uh, challenge and uh, but so far I would say so far so good um, but in the Middle East you need to have a lot of luck to get away with what's going on now. Thank you very much Shai and thank, thanks to all of you um, for an excellent sort of beginning. To the audience please um, do, not, do not be shy in using the chat box at the bottom of your screen to uh, pose questions to our panelists. And one thing occurred to me, um, particularly when Shai brought in the um, rather clever way the Israelis seems to have handled the Russians. Um, could, could the three of you, starting with you, Gary, say a little more about uh, the Russians and, and the Europeans in particular, since they were such an important part of the original J, JCPOA. And I get the sense that if, you know, if we do go back in, we won't be quite the top dog that we were in 2015. And how do you think that is going to play out? Well, this is to all of you vis-a-vis um, how we handle um, Europe and Russia that you know, have their own objectives now in the region? So it's a good, it's a very good question. The, uh, uh, of course, the partners to the JCPOA are the uh, British, French, EU, Russia, China, United States, Iran. All of the other parties to the agreement strongly opposed President Trump's decision to withdraw from the agreement. And in fact, the Europeans had been trying to negotiate some arrangement with the US that would discuss uh, areas of common concern about Iran's behavior that the allies would try to address if the US remained in the agreement. So the Europeans were very disappointed. The US withdrew from the agreement, but the Europeans didn't put up much resistance to the sanctions that the US Reimposed mainly because uh, just because of economic U.S. economic strength intimidated uh, European companies and banks from avoiding activities that could lead to sanctions. I think the current situation is that if Biden decides to try to revive the JCPOA, that will be supported by all of the other parties, 
Uh, and in fact, the Russians have already, I think, tried to make themselves helpful. Uh, the, uh, the deputy foreign minister, Sergei Ribkov, who was the actual Russian negotiator for the nuclear deal, recently met with Zarif and made it clear that he didn't think the US was going to lift all the sanctions in a single shot, that it would take some process. And the Europeans and the Russians have been urging Iran not to continue to accelerate its nuclear program in ways that are extremely unhelpful. So I do think that Biden will find um, uh, positive support diplomatically from the other parties. I also think the Europeans share the same concern that the US does that the JCPOA by itself doesn't solve the Iran nuclear problem because the limits fade away in five or 10 years. And as a consequence, they'll be very supportive of a follow-on agreement. I think whether the Russians and Chinese are supportive is a big question mark because uh, the uh, you know, bilateral relations between the US and Russia and the US and China have really deteriorated so seriously in the last couple of years that I'm not sure we can expect the same level of diplomatic cooperation from the Russians and the Chinese in terms of in these follow-on negotiations. And I think in particular, the tension in the region, well, between the US and Russia over Syria is much more serious now and may serve as an obstacle. But that, that's something I think Ellen can address better than I can. Yes, Ellen, do you want to weigh in on this one? Oh, I, I I'm totally in agreement with uh, Gary. You could just slightly cast it a little bit differently that the Europeans and the US are kind of like-minded. Some of the European countries have become as tough-minded as we are about not trusting the Iranians and being very deeply concerned about their activities. But that Russia and China, I mean, if we, we, we do have to step back and think about the changing political balance in the UN Security Council where Russia and China work together on questions of sovereignty, are very protective of you know, countries pushing back on too much interference in their internal affairs, and that both Russia and China would be seen as more sympathetic to Iran's sensitivities, I think. And so whether they, but I, I, I quite agree with the premise that on balance, both Russia and China want the agreement to hold, but how engaged will they want to be in toughening the agreement? I think probably not so much. And uh, Jeff, I know you and I had talked about the China angle here, whether should we assume that China and Iran have a significantly deeper relationship having signed this long-term kind of cooperation agreement uh, about a half a year ago, that in theory is an invest a Chinese investment in Iranian infrastructure. I think that both Iran and China are wary of each other, but I, I do believe that China sees Iran as a strategic prize of the region. And if assuming that China's interests are only growing and its confidence that it be a global power are only growing, we should assume that China will see a, a strategic benefit in having a good relationship with Iran. And that probably means that China would be more protective of Iran's interests in uh, some future negotiation. Shai? I, I, I largely agree with both Gary and Ellen on this, uh, on this point. I think that the, 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 the key question is really uh, here is, uh, is, I mean, it's clear that the Europeans are going to applaud an effort to restore uh, the JCPOA. The question with the Europeans, but even, but as Ellen said, I think mostly with the Russians and the Chinese is how supportive will they be for an effort by the U.S. to uh, to improve the JCPOA, to, to deal with some of the JCPOA's imperfections, and like Ellen, I don't know, I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, although we do have to remember that uh, uh, there's one one issue though that um, it it's not clear to me um, what tensions uh, we can expect in U.S. Russian or between the US and Russia on the Syrian issue. Um, certainly the, the Trump administration uh, at least signaled in its actions that it really didn't care much uh, about uh, what the Russians are doing uh, in Syria. Uh, certainly, you know, a very, very stark contrast uh, 
to the role that the U.S. had uh, in 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 uh, in that part of the Middle East in the 1970s and 80s and so on and so forth. Um, you know what? You know how different uh, the Biden administration? How different would be the Biden administration's p uh, p uh, position? Um, how differently they would articulate the U.S. interests in 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 Syria? Uh, I think that's probably one of those things that are now being uh, reviewed, um, but we haven't seen it uh, yet. And and we have to also remember that the the decline in in U.S. Russian, especially U.S. Russian military relations, that began in the latter years of of the Obama administration over the Ukraine issue, um, and we still and now we're basically in the last few years we've seen. This, this quite remarkable situation in which mill-mill relations between Israel and Russia are markedly better than the mill-mill relations between the US and Russia. Um, so these are just uh, other dimensions to uh, what Gary and uh, Ellen um, talked about. Right, well, so, um, uh, I mean, Matt, do you have any, um questions that have come through to you through the computer screen? I haven't seen any on mine. Yes, uh, Jeff, I can actually pose one of them to you now if you'd like. Uh, this is a question from uh, Jim Phillips. Uh, what happens if Iran kicks out IAEA inspectors next week as threatened? Will the Europeans become more supportive of US negotiating position? What would it take for them to trigger a snapback of UN sanctions? Good question. Good question, Jim. Gary, you want to have a crack at that? Sure. First, just to clarify, uh, the Iranian threat is not to kick out the IAEA inspectors, but to reduce their access, to reduce their uh, freedom of action under the additional protocol. The additional protocol basically gives the IAEA greater rights to seek access to suspect facilities. So undeclared nuclear activities, secret nuclear activities. Um, now, the JCPOA has an independent mechanism for the IAEA getting access to suspect facilities. Separate from the additional protocol, it's actually stronger than the additional protocol. I mean, one of the, I think, strong features of the JCPOA is that it, that it has a monitoring system that's considerably stronger than the international standard, including most importantly, access to possible secret facilities, which is where Iran is much more likely to try to build nuclear weapons, not declared facilities because there are just too many inspectors there and it would be too easily detected. So it's not clear to me that this Iranian threat means very much in terms of day-to-day -day verification of the JCPOA. At the same time, I do think it's a dangerous move from Iran's standpoint. As Ellen mentioned, the Europeans have really become pretty skeptical about Iran's uh, motives and actions on both missile and nuclear activities. And the more that Iran does things that begins to erode the verification system in the JCPOA, I think that actually drives the Europeans closer to the American position. So. It, of course, Biden will be welcomed by open arms by the Europeans anyway, because he's not Donald Trump. But I do think the Iranians will have to be careful not to act in such a way that makes it easier for the U.S. to reassemble an international coalition against them. Thank you. So we have some questions coming in now. And the first one, um, I guess, is for you, Shai. It's from Henry Rome, who thanks us for a great discussion. Um, he asks you, Shai, why has BB not launched an anti-JCPO return campaign yet? Is it simply because Biden hasn't taken the decisive step yet, and so no need to yet? Or is it possible BB will not take a, 20, a 2015 approach? Seemed to me that choosing Ben Shabbat and not Cohen as the envoy was interesting. I don't quite understand that, but maybe you could answer it, Chai. Well, the issue of the envoy actually has to do more with uh, uh, Israeli uh, domestic jockeying, um, but uh, I don't think that's, um, I think that's not important. Um, I think that 
I think that Netanyahu uh, understands, as I said, that he has to be careful. Um, my own guess is that, uh, you know, there was, a, uh, there was an, the fact that Obama uh, was not, in my view, personally a very emotional individual uh, actually allowed him uh, to tolerate uh, certain behaviors uh, that Netanyahu uh, manifested in 2015. Um, I, I, I don't think that there is this kind of certainty uh, among responsible people uh, in Israel that Biden's reaction uh, to the kind of guerrilla warfare that uh, went on in, 19, in, in 2015 uh, would, would be similarly um, tame. Uh, so I think that, uh, that Netanyahu uh, is, 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 is more careful here. But, and I think that there is also, uh, and I think the Biden administration, if, I, if my interpretation is correct, has already signaled um, its uh, displeasure. Um, uh, in other words, it was basically sending a message, don't even think about going back to the kind of games you played in 2015. The fact is that uh, yesterday was the first phone conversation between, between Biden and Netanyahu. Um, Israeli prime ministers didn't usually wait a whole month to hear uh, from the president of the United States. And I think that to some extent this was an, a, a reaction uh, to the kind of signals that initially came from Jerusalem, that if the Biden administration is thinking about going back to the JCPOA, uh, you know, there was some expression by some senior official un, un, unmentioned, the name was not mentioned, um, that, uh, that Israel is not, you know, going to have anything to do with the Biden administration as if Israel has the, the, has the luxury of not dealing uh, with, the, with, the, with any U.S. Uh, administration. I, but I also think that it had something to do with the, uh, uh, with the speech of the IDF chief of staff, as I said. I think the signal was um, you, want, you, you have some, uh, you, you have some uh, views to express about where we go on this issue fine, we're willing to have a conversation, uh, but the conversation is a conversation, is not, uh, is not having um, the chief of staff of the IDF give a, a public speech um, in, which, in which he said uh, uh, that, that Israel is not going to accept um, uh, any cosmetic changes to the JCPOA. Um, so I think, that the, I think that the answer is that Israel is careful here. It, it, uh, it's, it's, it's measuring its way uh, with, the, with the Biden administration. Thank you, Shai. We've got time for one more question, which um, Trevor Filseth has, uh, has posed, and it has to do with the, the, uh, the extent to which the Biden administration will wait until we know who's won the Iranian elections in June. Um, and, and I guess the question, the question is that um, to all of you, particularly to Ellen and Gary, I mean, is, does it really, is there a possibility of, 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 of such a, a dramatic change in Iran's, out, the outcome of Iran's presidential election that it would um, cause the Biden administration to sort of rethink its approach? Uh, well, the conventional view is that the supreme leader is no longer charmed by the moderation of Rouhani and Zarif, uh, and that they are lame duck figures, um, and that the odds are that a more hardline uh, candidate will get the supreme leader's uh, endorsement in the in the June elections. Iran is quasi democratic. I mean, sometimes the popular will goes against what the Supreme Leader thinks he's set in, play, in motion. But um, if all goes according to that script, uh, we, will have, uh, we won't have Zarif to as the negotiator. And it could be that Iran kind of takes itself out of the, of the conversation uh, and that we are, the Biden administration doesn't need to go to maximum pressure, but can find itself 
needing that Obama era phrase, strategic patience. You know, do we just have to wait until conditions change? And so it could well be that we are in a very long and unsatisfying and unstable holding pattern with Iran with no significant improvement one way or the other. So I would just very quickly add, I'm not really sure it matters very much who the president is. As long as the Supreme Leader supports return to the JCPOA and is willing to authorize his negotiators to work out some practical uh, way to achieve that objective, I don't myself think that uh, we have to do a deal under Rouhani because the next president is going to do what the Supreme Leader says. Well, I think that's all we have time for now, um, unless uh, the three speakers would like one minute each to summarize where we stand. Um, I'll have to cut it off. Uh, we do have more questions, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, Shai, Ellen, Gary, last thoughts? One word? <laughs> You're very good at one words, Shai, I remember. <laughs> well, in one word, I would just say, uh, one really has to watch very, very, very carefully how things evolve on the Syrian and Lebanese front. I think that's where, that's where things can easily um, uh, run out of control. Uh, I, I don't see any you know, large, in the short range, I don't see any large dramas between the Iran nuclear issue, but, uh, but on Lebanon and Syria. That's uh, a good day. Every, a very... every, every day is a new day. That's a very good headline. Now, Gary, do you have a sort of similar headline? That... Yes, uh, yes, my nightmare is Iraq. I think that's where the US and, a, and Iran are most likely to clash uh, through uh, uh, proxy forces, through you know, militia groups friendly to Iran. And I think the attack in, the attack in Erbil could very easily lead to a kind of attack and counterattack situation that could upset the nuclear negotiations. Ellen, your, your um, sort of headline uh, out, out of this whole discussion? Uh, two perhaps contradictory thoughts. One is whether the Abraham Accords will give Iran the feeling that it is even more besieged, isolated, or that the you know, regional consensus is against it. And will it make Iran feel more insecure and therefore perhaps, you know, uh, um, even tougher minded about its own security interests. But the second is whether the region perceives this gradual decline of American interest in being the, the primary security partner, whether they perceive US restraint, and I think Biden will be like Trump and Obama in this regard, whether they perceive US restraint as in some way triggering a more regional ownership of the security agenda. Don't know if that could be good news, Probably not, but um, in theory, uh, make less assumptions that the US is gonna set the agenda. What do the regional players come up with on their own? Look, thank you all very, very much. Extremely interesting, very timely conversation. And I'm certain we will come back to address this um, sooner rather than later. So for everybody um, who watched in on this gloomy day, um, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you next time.